Hi there, welcome to Chamber Live, first one of 2021, brought to you by the East Lancs Chamber of Commerce. Today's topic is as simple as A, B, C, answers on Brexit and COVID. And the views expressed in this webinar don't necessarily represent the views of the East Lancs Chamber of Commerce and all facts contained within are believed to be correct at the time of recording, which is the 21st of January 2021. And if 2020 was to be summed up in two words, they would probably be coronavirus and Brexit. So it seemed fitting for this first event of the year that we tackle both those topics, in particular, the, the employment law implications for employers. So uh, to do that, I'm delighted that we joined by Ollie McCann and Roxanne Buckley, both from Naphthans. Uh, Ollie is partner in the employment team. He's also head of Naphthans East Lancashire office, part of a 25 plus strong team of employment fee earners. And he brings with him 22 years experience in employment law. And whilst covering all aspects of employment law, he specialises in TUPE, trade unions, disputes, restructures and senior exits. He also acts for employers of all sizes, industries and sectors, and he's been working supporting employers for over 15 years. His colleague Roxanne is an employment associate also uh, with Naphthans. She brings with her over five years post-qual experience, got a keen interest in assisting clients with business immigration queries. She acts for employers on a range of employment matters, including general day-to-day -day advice and employment tribunal cases also assisting with large scale and ad hoc projects, including redundancies, changing of terms and conditions, and TUPE. Uh, that's our experts for today. Uh, let's meet them. Over to you guys. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. And uh, just a happy new year to, to everyone on this Zoom call. Um, on, on the one hand, whilst um, the year has started off with uh, high levels of COVID infections and, and a, a very worrying uh, daily death toll, I'm hoping that there is still hope and we should cling on to that hope. And there's hope for, for two reasons. Obviously, we've got the vaccine, um, which is now being rolled out. Um, hopefully, we'll continue to crank up over the next few months. Um, and that will hopefully start edging us towards some kind of normality. Uh, and then the other area of hope is Brexit. You know, we actually have some clarity on what Brexit looks like, which has uh, been long awaited by many businesses. Um, and now that we have that clarity, it allows businesses to, to plan and move forward. I'm not saying it's perfect, and I think there has been some teething issues, um, but hopefully things will get better over the course of the, the first half of this year. Uh, so let's cling on to that hope, and um, hopefully let's battle through the next few months and, and things will surely get better. In terms of today, I'll just uh, start sharing my screen. Um, as Simon said, we're going to talk a little bit about COVID-19, just bringing you up to speed with the uh, current furlough scheme arrangements, but also some common issues that we're seeing arising from the current sort of COVID scenario um, in comparison with previously. Um, and then I'll be passing over to Roxanne, who will give you a steer on um, Brexit and what it means for your staff, particularly your EU employees, and um, but also about future recruitment from abroad. Okay, so I'll just uh, share my screen. Here we go. There we are. Start here. Um, so yeah, there's the agenda. I said, we're going to have a quick look at the key differences with this new coronavirus job retention scheme. It's an extended scheme, but it does have some differences to the one that we were used to in summer. Um, and then I'll be having a look at just a few challenges for employers that are arising from this uh, current sort of lockdown and, and increased uh, infection rates and, and transmission rates. Uh, and then Roxanne will pick up on Brexit. Um, I think in terms of the coronavirus job retention scheme, I think the starting point is just to remind ourselves as to what the purpose of that scheme is. And it's really important because when you're claiming under this scheme, you've got to do so in line with the purpose of the scheme. If you're not acting in accordance with the purpose of the scheme, then you're exposed to a, to a risk at the HMRC when they finally get around to auditing this, conclude that you've been abusing the scheme. So there are three sort of uh, areas that we would look at in order, in order to understand the purpose of the scheme. We've got the fifth trans treasury direction. Um, it does mirror previous versions, um, but this simply confirms that it will provide reimbursement of employment costs incurred with eligible staff arising from the health, social and economic emergency in the UK due to COVID-19. Um, and the new aspect um, for the extended scheme um, says that it uh, arises from the emergency resulting from the resurgence of COVID-19 and further measures taken by the government to reduce transmission, loss of life, demands and uh, the effects on the economy. 
Um, we've also got uh, the HMRC policy paper, um, which confirms that the purpose is to support individuals and businesses. So we're not just looking at it from a business perspective, we'll be looking at it from an employee's individual perspective as well, who are impacted by the disruption caused by COVID-19 this winter. And then we have the online government guidance regarding the job retention scheme, which was issued on the 10th of November, um, which basically says uh, you can furlough staff if you cannot maintain workforce due to operations affected by COVID-19. It's intended to help employers whose operations have been severely affected by coronavirus to retain employees and protect the UK economy. However, all employers are eligible to claim under the scheme and it recognises that different businesses will be impacted in different ways by COVID-19. So in summary, um, really employers need to continue to demonstrate that your operations have been severely affected by COVID-19 um, and that ideally that your use of the furlough scheme now is as a result of the resurgence of COVID-19 and the increased uh, in transmission uh, infection rates and, and daily death rates and the lockdown that the government has imposed. Um, I think one lady at the beginning was saying that she'd um, been back to the office for the past five months and now is working back from home as a result of lockdown. So that kind of shows the impact it's had on businesses um, as a result of this resurgence and the, the new government guidelines around lockdown. So just make sure you're falling in line with that purpose to avoid any issues further down the line. In terms of um, key points to note from this current scheme, um, firstly, it's extended until the 30th of April 2021, um, which is great news, gives uh, protection there for both businesses and employees uh, for at least the next uh, you know, sort of four months. Um, eligibility um, um, is relevant to all employees as long as they were employed by you on or before the 30th of October 2020. It does not matter whether they've previously been furloughed or not, as long as they're on the payroll and subject to an RTI submission before the 30th of October 2020, then you can claim for them. Um, in terms of calculating the 80% grant for your employees' wages, just be mindful that the method of calculation will differ depending on whether the salaried employees, their work varies um, sort of from, from week to week or have variable hours. And also, there's a different calculation depending on whether your employees were employed before the 19th of March 2020 or afterwards. And so those in payroll will have to just make sure that they understand when the employee started and that they're applying the correct calculation approach to calculate the grant. Um, just to reiterate also that furlough is a variation of the employment contract. Um, each time you place an employee on furlough under a new agreement, it is a variation. So you do need to seek the employee's agreement, or if you recognise a trade union um, and you collectively bargain with them, then you need to seek agreement with the trade union. And that agreement needs to be evidenced in writing. Now, there's no nothing in the guide says that there has to be a formal agreement. It just says it needs to be evidenced in writing. But as a lawyer, my advice would be to try and get a formal agreement drafted and signed, signed by both parties agreeing to the, uh, the furlough or the new furlough that you've placed the employees on. Um, if you don't, there is a risk that employees will assert that you've imposed the furlough upon them, that that's a breach of contract, could give rise to constructive dismissal claims, or they may not claim constructive dismissal now, but they might use it as a breach of contract. And then if there's subsequent breaches of contract further down the line, they could then bring a constructive unfair dismissal claim further down the line. So we just need to avoid the risk of breach of contract claims. Um, another key change um, to know is from the 1st of December 2020, you can no longer claim um, the grants for, um, for income paid to employees once you've served notice to terminate their employment. So if you are, for example, making someone redundant, as soon as you serve them notice to make their role redundant, you cannot claim the grant even if they serve their notice period on furlough. So you've got to pay them their full pay during the notice period and cannot claim the grant uh, for that period. The guidance uh, from the government only references notice as a result of redundancy, resignation or retirement. It doesn't say anything about notice um, that's been given to an employee because of, um, let's say, misconduct or long-term ill health, or for any other reason, it would be safer to assume that the notice, um, any notice issued to an employee, you shouldn't be claiming the grant for, because if you look at the overall purpose of the scheme, which is to try and retain staff, 
once you serve notice to terminate, you're no longer retaining the staff. And then a final point to note um, is Tupi. Um, the guidance has confirmed that um, some employees that are subject to a Tupi transfer may be eligible to be furloughed. Um, however, when you dig down into the detail, it appears that the government have only um, limited this to what we call a standard business transfer. And what I mean by that, um, standard business transfer is um, sort of something akin to a sale and acquisition of a business um, or a transfer of an undertaking, such as a change in ownership of a, um, I, I don't know, a restaurant, for example, not necessarily a sale and purchase, but there may be a new licensor that's running the pub. Um, if it's a service provision change, then it is unclear as to whether this is covered under the job retention scheme, whether you can claim for employees that have moved over because of a service provision change. An example of a service provision change will be, let's say the domiciliary care sector, they will win and lose contracts with the local authority um, on a yearly basis. When they win a contract um, from the local authority, if there was an existing provider providing that contract and they're taking over that contract, then that will be a service provision change and the employee is eligible to transfer to the, to the new provider. Unfortunately, um, it's possible that the, those staff that are transferred as a result of a service provision change aren't caught. What I would say is take legal advice because sometimes um, it could be both a standard business transfer and a service provision change. And if we're unsure, still, after reviewing the, the details of the transfer, we can always um, liaise with the HMRC and try and get consent that they can be furloughed. Just a, a reminder also to keep records. Um, really important that you retain records for six years and there's a list of records there that you should be keeping. These slides will be distributed afterwards so no need to, to make notes of those now and you can cross-reference that after this session. Um, I think the best thing that uh, the government ever did was to introduce flexible furlough. Um, I think a lot of businesses were really struggling at the outset with furlough because they still had some work that needed doing, but not enough work to keep people employed for um, sort of full time, for example. So the flexible furlough scheme has been an absolute godsend to many of our clients and, and lots of other businesses. Uh, however, um, because you are flexible, you know, so flexibly furloughing staff, you need to make sure your records are spot on. So take, for example, a salaried employee who may be contracted to work 37 and a half hours a week, but invariably works more than that because they're a dedicated member of staff and maybe do 40, 42 hours a week. How are you going to record the hours that they don't work and make sure you've got evidence of it? So just make sure you've got those records in place. Another thing just to bear in mind also is that where you are um, placing staff on, on furlough, you need to have a minimum claim period of seven calendar days for those staff um, within the claim period. Your claim periods will be a month, so it will be January, then February, then March, and then April. Those staff need to have been furloughed over a period of seven days within that claim period. And then finally, I think I say it's just making sure that employees don't undertake any work during the hours that they are recorded as furloughed. So I've got a colleague who is flexibly, flexibly furloughed because of childcare issues. Um, she would ordinarily work a lot, 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 more, lot more hours than her contracted hours, but we've agreed two afternoons a week when she won't be working and we're going to keep records of her logging off and making sure that she doesn't log on during her normal contracted hours for that afternoon, for example. Um, in terms of holidays and furlough, um, it is, um, well, firstly, employees do continue to accrue holiday leave whilst they are furloughed, whether flexibly or otherwise. Um, you can um, only utilise the coronavirus scheme, a like job retention scheme, if it's affecting your operations, which means that you cannot place someone on furlough because they are just about to go on, on, a, on take some paid leave. The purpose for putting them on furlough has to be about the impact on your business operations or because the individual is uh, disruptive with childcare issues, etc. So that's got to be the purpose of placing them on furlough. But once on furlough, employees can take holiday whilst on furlough. And likewise, you can give them notice to take holidays whilst on furlough. The government has also confirmed in its guidance that it is possible to vary the holiday entitlement as part of the furlough agreement. Um, but you cannot, of course, go below their statutory minimum entitlement. I've not seen any of my clients 
seek to vary the holiday entitlement when furloughing staff. Um, I think what the government was perhaps thinking here is perhaps employees that are, are, for example, have 28 days plus bank holiday, so 36 days a year, they may well have sort of been looking to reduce the holiday leave down to the bare minimum statutory entitlement of 28 days. So whilst it's possible, you would still need the employee's consent or agreement to that. Um, and, and you've got to have a think about whether that is the right thing to do, the impact on employee relations, etc. What might be a better approach is within the furlough agreement is to insist that for every week of furlough that they, the employee is on, they take, for example, half a day's leave or a day's leave so that they're using the holidays that they accrue whilst furloughed as they go along which then just prevents that build-up of holidays when they finally come back from furlough. So just have a think about that and, and ways in which you can ensure that you don't have a big holiday liability once furlough is over. Um, bank holidays, um, if the employee usually works a bank holiday and um, but you furloughed them, then you can include them for the grant payment. If they would usually take bank holiday as a leave day, i.e. the business would ordinarily be closed, then that can be treated as holiday but you are expected to top up the grant to normal pay um, or give them a day in lieu instead. And just as a side note there, when employees are taking holiday leave during furlough, they must be paid their normal rates and you can only claim 80% of that back. Now, one of the most frequent questions I've probably had since December is um, what do employers do when they need to select who to place on furlough um, and it's a valid question to ask because we need to ensure that we don't treat employees unfairly and uh, we need to be mindful of the risk of any discrimination allegations if people feel that they've been picked on or placed at a disadvantage because of the way in which we've selected people for um, for furlough um, and we also need to be mindful of, of health and safety risks as well um, so a classic example is when you're looking at furlough, if a person carries out a particular role and that role is no longer required temporarily because of the impact of COVID and there's no one else doing that role, then that's a very straightforward, your role is not currently required, we're placing you on furlough and then the furlough. The problems really arise when you've got, let's say, a group of 20 machine operators, but you haven't got enough work to sustain them all. So you need to reduce it down to, let's say, 10 machine operators. How are you going to select that 20, well, those 10 people to be furloughed and those 10 people to carry on working? So there's things that you need to be thinking about. In that particular scenario, you could have a look at a rotor basis to make it fair so that everyone is furloughed at some point in time um, on, a, on an equal basis. But that might not always be possible. And you might want to start thinking about, well, actually, what about those people that want to be furloughed because they've got childcare issues with the school closures? What about those people that have health issues and are concerned about their increased risk because of COVID-19, particularly those that might be clinically extremely vulnerable? So we need to maybe think before implying a, a rotor basis for staff to go on furlough or just selecting people for furlough, let's ask for some volunteers and to come forward um, and see if people want to volunteer for furlough because of their particular individual circumstances. If at that point we don't get enough volunteers, then we'll need to think of a fair selection process. Likewise, if we get more volunteers than we actually need for furlough, then again, we'll need to have a look at how we're going to select those that will be furloughed from the group that want to be furloughed. So just some examples to highlight the risks. An employer decides to furlough all pregnant women um, and all staff with childcare responsibilities as they think this is the fairest way to decide because these are the people that will need to be furloughed um, given the school closures and the risks to, to pregnant people. The possible legal risk that we have here is indirect age discrimination. So you may well have older people who feel more vulnerable. So let's say those are 65 plus still working in your workplace and may well feel that they're more vulnerable to COVID-19 in the workplace or they may have underlying health conditions which make them more vulnerable. So they may well feel that they've been um, disadvantaged by not being afforded the same opportunity to furlough as those other people. So they could bring an indirect age discrimination claim. Likewise, those with disabilities could bring an indirect disability discrimination complaint. You've also got on the other side, 
the uh, potential risk of uh, indirect sex discrimination or pregnancy discrimination claims from, from those women um, who are forced to go on furlough because they're pregnant. Um, that, that you know, we shouldn't assume that they want to be furloughed just because they might be at increased risk. If they've been placed on furlough and receiving less income, they're at a disadvantage and there's a clear risk there. Likewise, for those staff that are, have childcare responsibilities, whilst we think we're doing them a favour, we might not be because it um, depends on who in the family might be there to, to provide that childcare. Uh, and, and secondly, even if we provide the um, sort of the opportunities of those with childcare responsibilities to be furloughed in advance of everybody else, then that's likely to affect more women than men because more women take on the childcare responsibilities. And so there, again, we've got this issue of indirect sex discrimination. So it can be littered with risks. Uh, other issues, uh, other example, employer permits employees who are clinically extremely vulnerable people to be furloughed, but refuses to permit those asking for furlough to care for children due to childcare issues. Risk here is indirect sex discrimination. Women with primary childcare responsibilities may struggle to work and therefore this results in them having to take dependent care leave unpaid if they can't come into work. If So if we're given priority to the extremely vulnerable people and the women with the childcare responsibilities who have to stay at home because the children are at home, schools are closed, they're going to feel disadvantaged. There are going to be more women affected than men. We've got that indirect sex discrimination issue. Now, I've just put at the bottom of this slide, can the employer justify this policy approach it has adopted and it might be possible to have a defence to any indirect discrimination claims if we can objectively justify our approach. And it may be in these circumstances that if we've got um, lots of clinically extremely vulnerable people, that it is indeed the right thing to do to put them ahead of people who have childcare issues, because we need to protect the health and safety of those people that are clinically vulnerable. But I'm just flagging it as a risk. We need to go through this thought process when we're selecting for furlough. So in terms of selection, what are your options? I would always say sleep volunteers first. Um, it's the easiest way to minimize the risk. If more volunteers are, uh, that, that are received than you actually need, have criteria to place those, um, you know, sort of uh, in, you know, prioritize those individuals that need furlough the most, clinically extremely vulnerable people, clinically vulnerable people, childcare issues, um, and those that potentially live with clinically extremely vulnerable people. If you've got too few volunteers, then ap apply objective selection criteria akin to a redundancy selection process. So that might involve criteria such as length of service, disciplinary record, attendance record, a timekeeping, etc. Um, and then sort of similar principles will apply in terms of bringing people back from furlough. So we've had all those complications around how do you select people to go on furlough but then if you need to bring people back from furlough at different times who do you select to come back first and how do you select them and the same principles will apply there and um, in terms of uh, redundancy and furlough just uh, to reiterate that um, it is possible to engage in redundancy consultation, both individual and collective consultation, whilst employees are on furlough. It's also permissible for employees to be appointed as employee representatives for the purposes of redundancy consultation, if necessary, and still be furloughed. Um, what you cannot do is use the job retention scheme towards the statutory redundancy payments, nor can you use it towards notice pay during notice periods. So the question then is, well, if we can't use the job retention scheme to fund part of the notice period, which was possible last summer, is there any benefit of an organisation commencing a redundancy process during the job retention scheme and whilst people are furloughed? There's a big question mark as to whether or not there is really any benefit there might be some small benefits. I suppose what you are saving as a business is ongoing accrued holiday leave. Um, you're also still paying when people are furloughed the employee national insurance and the pension contributions. So there's some cost savings there. But ultimately, depending on how much cost that is, is there any real benefit doing it now? Or are we best just waiting until the spring and reviewing what the business needs are in or around March, April time to decide whether or not we need to restructure and make some redundancies? And um, so these are the kind of thought processes 
that you'll need to work through as a business as to the benefits um, against the cons of going through a redundancy process now. Um, there will be circumstances where some employees are not eligible to be furloughed. Um, so, for example, those that might have to be transferred under a service provision change or those that were employed on or after the, the 1st of November 2020. So if you need to um, reduce your um, labour costs during this period, then but you can't furlough that particular individual, then other options to look at, unpaid leave or sabbaticals. Flexible working, can we flex their working arrangements, their hours of work, their days of work, um, so that we reduce their, you know, the cost associated with their job for a temporary period? Could we ask them to start using some of their accrued holiday leave um, to, to minimise uh, sort of future costs further down the line? Um, I've had one client who's created its own version of the furlough scheme. Um, they did this just before the government brought back the fill scheme into place so they were getting ready for the um, sort of 1st of October or 1st of November when the scheme the old scheme ran out and before it was extended they created their own version of the furlough scheme which would have placed employees on 50% pay and um, but would have been fully funded by the company um, and then other options is looking at your contracts of employment to see whether or not you have a layoff clause or a short time working clause if you have that clause in your contract then that is certainly something to explore but just be mindful that after four continuous weeks of layoff or short time working or six aggregate weeks in a 13 week period, that crystallizes a right for the employee to claim redundancy pay if they're eligible for redundancy. Um, so just looking at um, some, some sort of, I suppose, challenging areas for employers and um, starting point is clinically extremely vulnerable employees. Um, these are the employees that have been uh, identified by the government as the individuals that are most at risk to COVID-19 as a result of underlying health conditions and they will have received a letter from their GP or the NHS to confirm that they are clinically extremely vulnerable and given them instructions to shield. There is government guidance uh, for people uh, in this category to shield and in short, that says that they must work from home if possible. And if they are unable to work from home, they should not attend work at all. Very clear instruction. Um, and it would be sort of extremely risky for an employer to go against that. So in those circumstances, what options does an employer have in relation to that employee? Well, firstly, you could look at alternative roles to see if you can move them into a role that allows them to work from home. You could look at changing their working pattern, which means that they don't come into contact with people in the workplace or a change in where they work and um, you're still providing facilities for them to work. Um, or if those aren't viable options, then you can look at statutory sick pay or place them on furlough. I can't see any reason why in those circumstances an employer wouldn't place someone on furlough unless they're not eligible. Um, we also have um, a lot of scenarios occurring, occurring from employees who are um, a member of the household um, of someone who is clinically extremely vulnerable and worried about coming to the workplace. And so, for example, you know, they will have their, their partner is clinically extremely vulnerable. They themselves are perfectly fit, but they don't want to increase the risk to their partner by coming to work and coming back from work. Um, in this in this scenario, the government guidance actually says that those individuals should continue to attend work as normal. And therefore, with that government guidance saying that this particular individual, I don't think, should be eligible for furlough, regardless of their fears or concerns, um, the fact is that the government guidance say that they should continue to attend work. And as long as they are fit to do so, then that's what should happen. Then we have the scenario around some clinically extremely vulnerable people wanting to return to work. So whilst they have an underlying health condition that places them at risk, they love the job, they feel they need to be keeping their mind occupied and want to come back to work. And what do you do in that scenario? Well, I think the starting point has got to be health and safety risk assessments. We need to understand what is the risk to that particular individual um, having regard to the specific underlying health condition they've got. Having regard to that risk, is there anything we can do to minimise that risk as much as practicably possible? It would be sensible to also get um, advice from occupational health or the GP on whether or not this individual is fit 
to come to work given their underlying health condition and the working environment that may have an exposure to COVID-19. Um, so we'd need all that information before we could make an informed decision as to whether to allow them ret to return to work or refuse their return to work. If we refuse their return to work, then the employee may well assert that they've been subject to disability discrimination or less favorable treatment. And then we're going to be um, sort of having to rely upon our defense of objective justification, which comes back to the point of the more work we've done around assessing the risk, getting input from occupational health or a GP, talking to the employee about alternatives. If we conclude that there's nothing we can do, then we're in a much better position to defend any such claims. Now, the guidance, the government guidance has a clear list of those individuals or those, those health conditions that result in people being clinically extremely vulnerable. And going back to April 2020, there was also a list of individuals that were clinically vulnerable people. So this was one step down from clinically extremely vulnerable. Uh, and these were people that were at moderate risk. Bizarrely, that seems to have dis disappeared from the government guidance, but it's still listed on the NHS pages. Now, with the guidance, the government guidance having disappeared in relation to clinically vulnerable people, and there is no specific guidance as to, as to what to do with these individuals, then my only suggestion is that we treat these individuals like any other individual that has an underlying health condition, um, whether or not that would be clinically vulnerable or not, and we'll treat them exactly the same. And we just need to understand what is that health condition, in making sure it's not within the cl clinically extremely vulnerable categories, and if it's not, we then just assess the risk from a health and safety perspective. We consult with the employee about alternatives to, to get them to work, uh, work in a safe way and how we can make adjustments to ensure that they can work in a safe way. Um, and we get occupational health input if we think it's necessary. Ideally, we want that occupational health input to assess the level of risk for this particular individual and their condition. Is it low risk? medium risk or high risk and having regard to that what recommendations do they make and um, pregnant employees um, so pregnant employees were under the clinically vulnerable people categories until the government seems to have uh, removed it and this is a moderate risk um, of um, increased you know, increased risk to COVID-19 um, as a, and, and they were listed as a precautionary measure by the government. Um, the first starting point is with any pregnant employee, an employer is under an obligation to carry out a health and safety risk assessment um, just to ensure that, they're, um, that, they're, that, that the individual themselves and their unborn child is not at increased risk because of the job they do. That has to be done, but it also now needs to be done taking into account the uh, sort of the COVID-19 uh, infections and, and risks in the workplace that we've got and how secure, COVID secure our workplace is. But the guidance, the government guidance does split it out into two categories. So employees who are pregnant with less than 20, who are less than 28 weeks pregnant, they're subject to a risk assessment, but they can continue to work. If it's not possible to manage the risks, then we need to offer them suitable alternative working arrangements, including working from home or where that isn't possible and there's no other alternatives, then we're going to have to consider suspension on normal pay. Where they are working, then it's important they adhere to national social distancing guidelines. For those employees that are 28 weeks, preg uh, 28 weeks pregnant or more, or they are pregnant but have an underlying health condition which increases their risk to a greater impact of COVID-19, then you need to adopt a more precautionary approach it will be sensible to redo the risk assessment at that point in time. Strong advice on working from home from the government um, and employers maximising the opportunity to do so. So this is a clear steer from the government that first of the employee should work from home and a clear steer to the employer that you should be doing everything you possibly can to facilitate that. It's not acceptable to put any barriers to working from home uh, in front of that employee. Again, if they are required to work, in the workplace, the social distancing needs to be followed um, and where applicable, um, we need to advise, you know, follow the advice for pregnant women who are clinically extremely vulnerable, shielding, for example. And then where, again, you, you've got no solutions to protect the individual concern, you're going to be suspending this employee on full pay for the remainder of their pregnancy. Now, I've put in there a link which will give you a full guidance on, on a full government guidance on, on advice for pregnant employees. 
Um, I just also want to touch other areas of um, sort of well, common issues that have been cropping up over the last few months and um, where employees are refusing to come to work. Now, the likely circumstances where this is going to occur are employees that live with vulnerable people, which I mentioned before, employees with childcare responsibilities who physically can't come in because they've got the children at home and they need looking after, employees who are feeling anxious about coronavirus, pregnant employees, employees who are pregnant uh, in, you know, partners, and then employees who would rather be on furlough. And then you've also got those people that fall within the category of clinically extremely vulnerable or have underlying health conditions. So just consider the scenario that you will get an employee potentially saying, I am not prepared to come into work. I think the risk to me is too great and therefore I'm not coming in. It's a refusal to work or they will refuse to do certain parts of their job because they think that part of their job puts them at increased risk because of COVID. We need to be mindful of um, Section 44 and Section 100 of the Employment Rights Act. Section 44 relates to being subject to a detriment. Section 100 relates to a dismissal. And in short, this, these sections say that an employee has the right not to be subjected to any detriment or dismissal. Um, and this applies in circumstances where, of danger, which the employee reasonably believes to be serious and imminent, and which they cannot reasonably avert. They take steps to protect themselves or other persons from that danger and that the steps were appropriate with reference to all the circumstances. So in that scenario, we've got to be mindful that it is highly likely an employment tribunal will conclude that COVID-19 is a serious and imminent risk of danger to any individual. Um, I suppose the older you are, the greater the risk. If you've got underlying health conditions, the greater the risk. Um, but also, it's not necessarily a uh, danger to that particular individual. It's in danger to other persons. So it could capture an employee who has a clinically extremely, extremely vulnerable partner living at home. And so that other person could be that partner at home, and they don't want to come to the workplace because it's because of the risk of danger to that partner by them coming to work and then going home, potentially having caught COVID-19 unaware of it. So where an employee is refusing to do, coming to work, we just need to be mindful before we launch into any AWOL procedure or disciplinary process, we need to be mindful of these provisions and ensure that we don't take any knee-jerk reaction and result in a claim. To be clear, Section 100 is an automatic unfair dismissal claim and also you do not need to have been employed for two years to bring this claim. It could apply to an employee that has started and is on their very first day of employment with you. So take care and take advice. The best advice I can give you is where you're faced with this is the starting point is to communicate with that individual, consult with them over their concerns, take them through the risk assessments that you've carried out for the workplace, maybe do a specific risk assessment for that individual if they've got a particular concern like an underlying health condition, or they've got someone living at home with an underlying health condition and see whether or not you can address their concerns by making some adjustments to the way in which they work. If having gone through that process, we're confident that what we're asking this employee to do is reasonable and that we've given them all the PPE that they need to avert the danger and they know what to do to avert the danger, then at that stage, if they continue to refuse to, to come into work or do a particular job, then we can start looking at taking appropriate action to address that misconduct. The key is where the employee cannot reasonably avert the danger. So an example would be um, a sort of let's a paramedic goes to a scene. Someone's been stabbed. Um, they've been called to attend the uh, you know the injured person. Um, you will, if you've ever watched um, sort of 999, watch your emergency, you'll see that the ambulance service will not go rushing in until the police are on scene. And the reason they don't go rushing in is because they are not trained to deal with any sort of circumstances of danger relating to a violent offender who might still be in the vicinity. So it would be reasonable for a paramedic to say, I'm not going to go and treat that patient until I'm sure that there is no risk, um, you know, in terms of an offender with a knife running around potentially putting them at risk. However, once the police arrive and they have controlled the scene, 
then it would be unreasonable for a paramedic to then go in and treat that patient because the you know the the circumstances of danger have been averted. So hopefully that gives you you know sort of so if you put the PPE in place, you've got your COVID nineteen sort of social distancing measures in place, etc. If you give them everything that they can do to avert that danger, then I think you've got good grounds to uh, to defend any claim and you can proceed and take action against the individual. I've currently got two health and safety dismissal claims on at this point in time, so it is a live issue. Um, employees are more you know more aware of their rights um, and obviously the the, the reading around the subject. So so just take care. Um, dealing with circumstances where employees refuse to work from home. Um, so if you are trying to encourage people to work from home, um, that's great. Um, and it's certainly a step in the right direction. But you've got to be mindful that some employees might push back on that because they don't think that their setup at home is appropriate for them to work safely from home. Or they may well conclude that their working environment, it isn't an appropriate working environment, perhaps because they've got the children at home um, with, with schools closed, um, and there isn't anywhere quiet where they can go and do their job properly. Um, again, where someone's refusing to work from home, which you can facilitate, then we need to establish the reason why they are refusing to do so. Um, if it's linked to their working environment not being um, appropriate to safeguard their health, safety and welfare, then we need to ensure that we address that and carry out a, a risk assessment. We need to ensure that we give them appropriate equipment to do that job properly. If we're confident that actually everything's in place that needs to be in place for them to work safely from home, and we're quite flexible around, we're not too bothered if you get distracted by things going on in the, in the house because of the children at home, et cetera, as long as you get on with your work as best you can do, then I would say at that point, their refusal to comply with your instruction is a refuse, it is potentially a misconduct issue and we could take disciplinary action. We've also got the scenario where employees who want to come into the workplace, um, sort of, you know, sort of, with, you know, who want to come into the workplace and don't want to work from home. Um, again, if we're going to permit someone to work in the workplace, we need to be sure that um, COVID secure measures are in place and that the health and safety isn't increased. I was speaking to one client over the Christmas period and um, they had allowed one individual to come back into the workplace because his home working environment just wasn't appropriate. He was really struggling. There are issues around mental health working from home as well because you don't have that sort of uh, engagement with other people. So they agreed for him to come back into the workplace with some measures um, in place to ensure that uh, he was safe. Um, but sadly, he actually contracted COVID-19 over the Christmas period and died a few weeks later. My client was extremely concerned whether they would be at risk to potential allegations that they've placed them at increased risk and um, by allowing them to work from the workplace. On that particular scenario, we were comfortable that actually all the COVID-19 secure measures in, were, were in place that need to be in place. They followed the government guidance so there was no increased risk. But that's, that's the risk we're playing with when we allow employees to come into the workplace where in theory they could legitimately work from home. So I will try to push back on it unless it's absolutely essential and there's good reasons to allow someone to come into the workplace. Okay. Um, final few topics from me before I pass over to Roxanne. Um, again, these are all issues that seem to be cropping up in the last month or so. Um, lots of clients asking about forcing um, employees to wear face masks in the workplace. I think the starting point is there is an implied term in every employment contract that an employee will follow the reasonable management instructions um, and if they fail to do so then we're into misconduct territory and potential disciplinary action. The key is on whether or not the instruction is reasonable. Interestingly um, the government guidelines around wearing face masks in the workplace doesn't say it's mandatory. In fact it almost reads against the need for employers to require staff to wear face masks in the workplace um, and only says that it's necessary where social distancing cannot be maintained or achieved um, and if you are going to wear face masks then it advised to wear non sort of medical face masks so you need to assess the you know, the you know you need to understand what is your business reason for wanting employees to wear face masks in the workplace i've had one client that I, I, I advised a couple of weeks ago on this particular issue, 
and they said we don't have an issue with employees not wearing their face masks at their workstations but when they're moving around the premises particularly because some of the corridors are quite narrow they want the staff to wear face masks because because of the increased risk of transmission the variants are you know the the, the, the covid variants are apparently more transmissible than they were this time uh, in, in summer last year um you know obviously we've got the risk of asymptomatic people in the workplace so their rationale for insisting that employees wear a face mask, wear a face mask when moving around the workplace seemed reasonable um, and so we've imposed it as a policy and making it clear that those that do not comply may be subject to disciplinary reaction. If you really want to avoid kickback from staff, I would consult with your health and safety committee if you've got one. If you haven't got one, um, I'd consult with, um, with your staff generally in terms of the, you know, the proposed policy, why we think it's necessary and try to get employee buy-in. The more employees that buy into that policy, the less likely others are going to kick up against it. And then if you do insist on sort of putting face masks, um, you're know, asking for face masks to be worn, then you should supply the PPE and provide instructions on how to use it. And also just be mindful of the reasons why someone might not wear a face mask. There may be a medical reason, they might have an exemption to doing so. And if they do, then we'd want some evidence of that. And then sort of making sure that their, their re refusal or, or unwillingness to do so is, is genuine. Simon, have you got a poll for this one? COVID testing in the workplace? Yeah, I'll throw it up now. So another common query we've got at this moment in time from employees is, can we insist on our employees to undergo a COVID-19 test in the workplace? So if you could just answer the, uh, the question there as to whether you've set, set, set it up or considering doing so. Well, wow, right, it's, it's settling down. Um, so I think the, the outcome of that is you've got nearly 50% are actually setting it up or considering it and 52% who aren't considering it at all. Um, so for the benefit of 50% of those in the room, um, I think it's worthwhile just touching upon the legal issues around sort of um, forcing this, uh, this you know, testing in the workplace. Um, I think the starting point is you cannot force an individual to physically undergo a COVID-19 test. That would be an invasion of privacy. Um, it's a risk of an assault. It will say you to do the test, you've actually physically got to, to put the, you know, sort of the swab down your throat and, and into your nose. So that would be an, an assault if we forced them upon it and clearly would never get to that stage. Um, but you also need to be mindful of the risk of processing personal sensitive data and, and how that's going to be um, you know, sort of process. But because you're processing personal sensitive data, you also need the individual's consent to do so. So you can't force it necessarily. Um, the question then is, well, if you can't force it, but we really want to do it, what power, if anything, do we have as an employer? And I think, you know, sort of, there's, you know, so the, the, we come back to this point around a reasonable management instruction. Um, and then, you know, is our instruction reasonable? And then is there refusal to undergo it unreasonable and we'd have to have a look at each case on its own merits for you know and each individual have their own reasons for refusing to undergo a COVID-19 test um, it could well be a conduct issue and it could well give rise to a disciplinary process if necessary um, I think again the key is to consult with staff or trade unions around introducing COVID-19 testing for the workplace it's about getting that message across that this isn't about finding out whether a particular individual themselves has COVID-19, because they may not be that bothered about it. And um, it's more about protecting their colleagues around them and making sure we don't have asymptomatic people in the workplace who think they're perfectly healthy, but in fact are a carrier of COVID-19. So it's getting that message across to them. It's consulting with the staff to try and get that buy-in. There is government guidance and ACAS guidance on this, and I've put the links there for you to use afterwards. Um, and that does talk a lot about consultation with staff and actually getting the staff to be involved in developing the policy for COVID testing in the workplace as well. Um, just because the more, the, more the, the more the staff are involved, the more likely the staff will take it up. In short, what you need to be doing is assessing the business rationale, 
do a sort of a, a benefits analysis as to the uh, to the testing that you want to put in place. What's the benefits going to be to the organisation? What's the the consequences or the detriments? Consultation with the health and safety committee or the unions um, or staff where none of those exist. Consider how it's going to be implemented. Communications with staff needs to be clear and informed, including any consequences for those declining to take part. And what happens, what will happen after a result is positive and how will we in comply with our data protection obligations in relation to the data we receive? And then how will results be communicated to staff and what information will be provided? It's all there within the government guidance. It's not that long or complicated, but it will be sensible to ensure you um, work in accordance with government guidance if you're going to put it in place. Okay, and then the final slide from me. Um, okay, Sam, if I can just move on to the next poll. I think, oh, yeah, okay, I'll do that now. Um, that's the vaccine one, yeah? Yeah. There you go. So the next issue is um, refusals to take the vaccine. So we've, uh, you possibly read in the, in the media, Pim Pimlico Plumbers, uh, no jab, no job very um, robust approach to uh, to the jab issue to say the least um i've also sort of read in the uh, in the newspapers earlier last week around the care home and um, looking obviously at the sort of old older and vulnerable people and um, where a fifth of their staff were refusing to undergo have the vaccines um so the question to you is are you um would you want to make the vaccine compulsory as a condition of continued employment with you um so we've got almost a, a sort of 50-50 split and 23% say yes, unsure 23% and then 55% 50, say no. Um, I'd love to say I know what the, um, the answer, to, well I'd love to say I know what the legal answer to this is, um, I presently don't. Um, Sam, can I just move on to the next slide, I'm just struggling to, to do so. Um, yeah, you'll need to, because you're a cohort, there, there, there you go. There we go, sorted it. Um, so currently we've got to, when we're assessing whether or not we have a business case, a legitimate business case to insist our staff undergo uh, vaccines, um, we need to take into consideration that currently the um, vaccine is not mandatory from the government. Um, and because it's not mandatory, what right does an employer have to make it mandatory? Um, it could be that the government may make it mandatory for certain job roles, in which case, if the government does that, and that will give obviously the employer the rights to insist that those individuals carrying out those jobs um, have the vaccine. Uh, and that's particularly for those working with uh, clinically extremely vulnerable people or maybe the elderly. Um, we need to just also you know, consider what the legal risks are if we insist on vaccination. Um, risk in my view are a potential breach of contracts and um, a breach of uh, when i say a breach of contracts could be a breach of implied trust and confidence if we're going to uh, force this upon staff and um, there could be discrimination risks around the age in that care home example where a fifth of the staff were refusing to have the vaccines that related to the majority of that you know that 25 or 20 percent were young people so if you've got younger people that are refusing to have the jab but we're imposing a policy that you have to have the jab or you lose your job then younger people are more likely to lose the job and therefore indirectly subject to age discrimination and um, so there's a risk there um i think the you know so the, the other risks are of risk of personal injury claim if someone has an adverse reaction to the vaccine and we force them to have it because of their job um, we also need to be mindful of the, pro, you know, of the fact that the vaccine might not remove the problem. Um, and so risky to rely on this as a business reason and so affects our reasonableness to insist upon it. I think the key point here is that currently, what we do know is uh, apparently the vaccine is effective in terms of stopping you being ill from the COVID-19. What, what, what we don't have the scientific evidence for is whether the vaccine will stop transmission from you if you've had the vaccine to another person. So you could still be a carrier of COVID-19 having had the vaccine, but transmit it to another individual. And if our policy around having vaccines in the workplace is around minimizing transmission to our colleagues or to our customers, then that argument falls down if the science, science, the science doesn't back that up. So until we get some developments from, from the various scientific bodies as to whether these vaccines stop transmission, then I think an employer would be 
um, extremely exposed to a policy of no jab, no job. I have read about um, employers changing their contracts of employment to make it a contractual requirement to have the jab. Now that's easy for new, new starters. If you employ someone next week, you could put a new clause in there as a condition of your employment or as a fundamental condition of your employment, you agree to undertake the vaccine when you're eligible to have the vaccine and will provide evidence. If you have that contractual clause in there, then we could rely on that as a breach of contract and also take disciplinary action against that individual for refusing to do so. Though we still might have some discrimination risks there. For existing employees, however, to put a new term into their employment contract requires you to vary their terms and conditions of employment. And that would then mean, depending on how many staff are affected, potentially collective consultation. If staff don't, don't agree to it, are you going to actually go down a termination of employment and offer a re-engagement, which carries its risk, carries with it risk as well? Um, so it's going to be very difficult to impose a contractual requirement on existing employees without a lot of effort and risk. Um, but the reason why some employers might look at this is because what they don't want to do is they don't want to rely on the implied term that the employee will follow a reasonable management instruction because if you have to rely on that implied term your business decision has to be reasonable and their refusable refusal needs to be unreasonable um so and that means it's a lot easier than for an employee to to bring a claim for unfair dismissal or or, or whatever if they then lose the job as a result of that instruction um so i think at this stage it's too early to say um it's certainly something to think about but until we get more information maybe more guidelines from the government more scientific data i think it'd be high risk to implement that approach at this point in time i think the benefits would be more around positive encouragement of people taking the vaccine particularly where your you know your organization is working with those that are clinically extremely vulnerable um or elderly people etc um my my sort of sort of sort of deal my dealings with those kind of individuals is that they are dedicated to their to the customers that they serve and 90 percent of them would always want to take the vaccine to protect them as much as themselves anyway um but yeah positive encouragement and communication with your staff is key to getting them on board so hopefully i've covered off all the um you know, all, all the issues um, relating to COVID-19 that we've been experiencing over the last couple of months. I will be taking questions at the end, but we've got 25 minutes left and I'm going to pass it over to Roxanne now just to uh, completely flip the topic onto Brexit and, and the implications um, for employees um, you know, and your staff. So I just need to share my screen with um, Roxanne. I think there's a way to do it, isn't there, um, Simon? We're currently looking at your screen and Roxanne's face, so I think that's working for us. Right, well, Roxanne, if you just tell me when to move on and I'll... Or, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Forward. I was hoping you'd suggest that because I'm really not technical. <laughs> this could go very wrong. Uh, brilliant. OK, so Brexit then. So it, this seems like a word that's been around for absolutely ages. And some of you are probably like, have we not already left the EU? What's going on? Um, so yes, we are out. The UK uh, voted to, to leave its biggest uh, trading partner um, in 2016. So lovingly termed Brexit, Britain's exit, it became the first and only country formally to leave the EU after 47 years of membership. Uh, we actually left the trading block on the 31st of January 2020, so it did already happen. Uh, but we were in a transition period, uh, running to the 31st of December. Um, to agree the terms of a new trade deal. So, um, you know, you, you'll no doubt would have seen the negotiations, uh, all the talk, you know, it was probably a bit like an episode of Game of Thrones trying to agree these terms between us um, to negotiate our exit. Um, in terms of sort of EU membership, a key right of EU citizenship is the free movement of workers. Um, and this is where we get onto what, what it actually does mean for your workforce. Um, so we had the entrenched right here that nationals of EU uh, member states can enter and reside a member state for up to three months without any restriction. Uh, beyond that, uh, they exercise treaty rights to take up employment and reside in another member state on the same terms and conditions as nationals of that particular member state. 
Uh, so a further key right was the free movement of goods in the internal market of the EU. Uh, again, this removed trade barriers between member states. Um, now that we've actually left, uh, we had to agree the terms of, of what any trade deals and things would look like moving forward. Uh, and we've now uh, agreed with the EU a trade and cooperation agreement. So in case any of you can't actually get to sleep at night, it actually runs to 1,450 pages if you're ever interested in reading what those terms are. Um, and that, that agreement was reached on the 24th of December to take effect from the 1st of January this year. So this sets out preferential arrangements in various areas and is underpinned by provisions uh, ensuring a level playing field uh, in respect of fundamental rights. Um, in terms of uh, our exit from the EU, uh, particular sectors which I think we'll see uh, the effect of this the most uh, is probably within the care and hospitality sector, uh, construction, manufacturing and agriculture. Uh, okay, um, so oh, let me just check that. Uh, I'm just checking that we're on the right slides, Ollie, sorry. So I'm on the slide where it says, what does Brexit mean for your workforce? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so uh, it's the end of free movement for EU and EEA and Swiss nationals uh, and equal treatment for all UK nationals and uh, the EU settlement scheme uh, is a new term which has been proposed. So internal law is derived from the EU, uh, including uh, sort of uh, rules on working time, chief P. Uh, during the transition period, so uh, last year, um, the UK's exit on the 31st of January uh, to 31st of December, EU citizens could continue to enter and remain in the UK under the principle of the free movement of persons. Now, with effect from the 1st of January this year, uh, EU nationals coming to the UK for the first time will be treated in the same way uh, as non-European nationals under the UK's new uh, immigration rules. Uh, if an EU member was residing in the UK by 11 p.m., on the 31st of December 2020, they may be eligible to apply for settled or pre-settled status under the EU settlement scheme. So a date for you all to put in your diaries uh, is the deadline for EU nationals to make such an application uh, under the settlement scheme. That is the 30th of June 2021. Uh, the reason for this long stop date is that it was agreed within uh, the withdrawal agreement that a minimum of six months from the end of the transition period, so uh, the period following on from the 31st of December 2020, um, that EU citizens and their family members um, would need that time to be able to apply for a status document. Uh, continuous residency is the main eligibility criteria uh, under the EU settlement scheme. Um, a person uh, should not be absent from the UK for more than six months in total in any 12 month period. And that's gonna be one of the main criteria as to whether they will get that status or not under that particular scheme. Um, Ollie, if you want to go on to the next slide. Okay, um, so check that you are protecting your current European workforce. So the rights and status of EU, EEA and Swiss citizens living in the UK by the 31st of December uh, will remain the same until the 30th of June. Effectively, that's what it means. Um, EU nationals and family members who enter before 11pm on the 31st of December 2020, they uh, should be encouraged to make an application under the EU settlement scheme. Uh, there are differences between settled and pre-settled status. Uh, settled status will grant the EU national and their families who've spent five years uh, in the UK the same rights as British citizens after Brexit. This includes equal rights on healthcare, education, uh, benefits and pensions. Pre-settled status is the status granted under the EU settlement scheme where the EU national has not lived in the UK for a continuous period um, of five years. Um, they may not need to apply under the EU settlement scheme if uh, your worker is an Irish individual um, or if they already have indefinite leave to remain in the UK. Uh, they do not need to exercise an application under that settlement scheme. Um, if the individual entered for the first time after 11pm on the 31st of December 2020, they will need to apply uh, under the new points-based immigration system, uh, which came into effect on 1st of January. They cannot apply under the EU settlement scheme, so that is the cut-off date at that point. 
Uh, a key thing here, so it is anticipated um, that there will be many uh, persons who benefited from the EU free movement law but failed to apply for status under the EU settlement scheme um, for reasons such as a lack of knowledge or other vulnerabilities. So this is just something that you need to be alive to um, as employers. So just ensure that those uh, dates are in the diary and that you are reminding your workforce to apply if it is required. Uh, Ollie, next slide. Okay, so the new uh, points-based system then, uh, which takes effect from the 1st of January this year, uh, this particular system treats EU and non-EU citizens equally. Uh, anyone that you want to hire from outside the UK, excluding Irish citizens, uh, will need to apply for permission in advance. And, you know, that's if they wasn't here on the 31st of December by 11pm. Um, the key of the new points based system is that a total of 70 points will be required uh, in order to apply to work in the UK. Uh, a sponsor license will also be required uh, to hire most workers from outside the UK who cannot apply under the EU settlement scheme. Um, there is, uh, it used to be known as the tier two general visa, it's now known as the skilled worker route. Uh, the job must meet, however, uh, the required skill level and pay the minimum salary. Um, so that's either 25,600, which is a general rate, or the going rate for the specific job, whichever is higher. Um, as you can see from that table, um, the particular characteristics, some of them are classified as mandatory, some of them are classed as tradable. So uh, the, the ones which are mandatory, they, you know, they have to meet those, and those are the points which are apportioned to that. The ones which are tradable, um, you can trade off those particular characteristics against a lower salary uh, to get the required number of points that you actually need. So if the job offer, for example, is less than the minimum salary requirement, the general rate of 25,600, uh, but it's no less than 20,480, an applicant may still be eligible under this points-based system and obtain those 70 points uh, if they do have a, a job offer, for example, in a specific uh, shortage occupation, or they have got a, a PhD which is relevant to the job that they're coming over to do, um, or they have got a PhD in a STEM subject, and that's science, technology, engineering and mathematics, and that is subject uh, uh, relevant to the job. Um, due to the points-based system and the mandatory requirement of the job uh, under a skilled worker route must be at the appropriate skill level, as you can see there, that is a mandatory requirement. Um, this means that it will only be possible to sponsor those individuals under the points-based system in usually medium or highly skilled roles. Um, the key here is that there are a number of other immigration routes to provide businesses with the flexibility that you do actually need. So this is not the only route now. Uh, and some of these routes do not require you to actually be a sponsor. Um, there is, I know a number of you uh, possibly are in the agricultural sector, there is a seasonal workers pilot, which has currently been launched. And, and this is currently running until the end of this year, which enables the recruitment of a limited number of temporary workers for specific roles in the horticultural sector. Um, Ali, next slide, please. Okay, so how to actually get a sponsor license then if you need to utilize this. Um, so the key thing here is, is not to delay. Um, there is a standard processing time of eight weeks for a sponsorship application. And before applying, you should check that the people that you do want to hire uh, will actually meet the requirements for coming to the UK for work um, as per that table. So things for you to consider in terms of obtaining a sponsorship license. So ensure that your business uh, does not have any unspent criminal convictions for immigration offences or certain other crimes such as fraud or money laundering. You can see how that would actually hinder your application uh, with the government. You also need to choose the type of skilled worker license that you actually want to apply for. Um, so, you know, you might have one where you've got offices, uh, international offices, and actually you just want to apply for an intra-company transfer type of sponsorship license. Uh, you can actually do that or you can even tag different licenses onto the same application. Um, you will also need to decide who will manage your sponsorship uh, within your own business. So um, once you actually get a sponsorship license, you communicate uh, via the sponsorship management system. Um, so here you'll have to appoint a, a level one user, an authorising officer and a key contact. Um, so you just need to have that uh, planning in place before you make such an application. Um, 
In terms of the cost of the online application, you can see those uh, there, but you also need to remember that there is an immigration skills surcharge, uh, which is a fee paid by UK employers for each skilled migrant worker employed via the skilled worker route and the intracompany transfer route. This is going to be a thousand pounds per worker for the first 12 months and then 500 pounds for each subsequent six month period thereafter. So you just need to bear these costs in mind when deciding whether to go for this type of application or not. Uh, Oli, next slide please. So right to work checks then. Um, so it is, it is an offence uh, to knowingly employ a person who does not have the appropriate right to work in the UK. Um, if you know you do take the checks that you do and it turns out that you unwittingly uh, employ someone who didn't have the right to be in the UK, you can be subject to civil penalties uh, from the government, uh, which is runs up to about £20,000 uh, per illegal worker that you've been found to employ. If you knowingly do so, um, then that cap comes off effectively on terms of that penalty. So it is a serious thing. So we do uh, need to ensure that we are doing the appropriate right to work checks. Now, obviously, because of COVID-19, um, you know, this had to be adjusted um, in terms of being able to conduct those checks moving forward. Um, so employers will continue to be able to confirm an EEA national's right to work using only their passport or national ID card until the 30th of June. Uh, this year. However, from the 1st of July this year, um, employers will no longer be able to accept an EEA or a Swiss passport alone as the evidence of a permanent right to work in the UK for new employees. Um, the Home Office's guidance on prevention of illegal working has actually been amended to account for a temporary adjustment to the right to work checks in light of COVID. Um, so since the 30th of March last year, the following temporary changes have actually been made. So checks can be carried out via video call. So here you would call uh, the applicant and get them to hold up the original document against their face so that you can actually check against a scanned document which has been provided to you. Um, so that's either you know, a scanned document or a photo of the document rather than them actually sending you the original. Um, if uh, acceptable documents cannot be provided, then employers uh, should also utilise the employer checking service online. Um, in terms of just conducting these checks in light of COVID, just remember to record the date that the adjusted check was made. Um, and there is a, a form of wording which is on the government website for you to record against that particular check. Um, just notifying that you had done an adjusted check on what date it was due to COVID-19. Then you do have to go back and do a retrospective check within the eight week period after COVID-19 measures end. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just a, a checklist for you then just to finalise from me. <laughs> um, so we just need to ensure that we are carrying out uh, audit checks on the workforce to ensure that we are compliant. Uh, you should be diarising key dates such as the 30th of June this year for applications under the EU settlement scheme to be made. Uh, diarised to undertake right to work checks on all employees and I say all employees just so that we're not sort of inadvertently putting ourselves or exposing ourselves at risk to any type of discrimination, race discrimination claims. Um, so make sure that we are diarising to do those checks in May or June of this year and record any pre-settled expiry dates uh, in order to diarise for any further subsequent checks thereafter. Um, and if the business does not yet hold a sponsor licence, uh, you should consider applying for one now as this will need uh, to sponsor EU or non-EU nationals from January this year. And also just consider uh, your obligations and the HR processes that you will need in order for this to be in place. And that was my whistle stopped one. <laughs> Great, thanks Roxanne um, and, and thanks Ollie. I'm gonna open the floor then to some questions. Um, We've got nine minutes to take any. Roxanne pulled it back there. Well done, Roxanne. Yeah, well done, yeah. <laughs> um, Ollie took his lion's share of your time. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. We do have a few questions in the chat box. I'll go to uh, to Steve Smith from the Northwest Employee Experience Group. Well, first of all, Steve, do you want to unmute yourself and put your question to, uh, to Ollie and or Roxanne? Hey, thanks, guys. So, Oli, I think the first question was around around the furlough. So, when we were talking furlough early earlier on, do you know what the current stats are for, for numbers of people 
in Lancashire that are currently furloughed, or is that not is that not yet available anywhere? I've not seen it available anywhere at the moment, Steve. To be honest, um, I'm trying to remember. There were some statistics from uh, last furlough back in summer, and there was a massive number yeah, of people. Uh, but I've not seen anything recently, um, so I can't help on that one, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's okay. Every one of your surveys can help with that. Well, that, uh, we do have some data, but it's it's just new EAG members. Um, you know, I was wondering whether there's any government statistics that we can um, that we can talk about, but there, there doesn't seem to be any. I can't find anything. No, no. I'll have a browse and um, see if we can find anything on the information I've got. And if I have, I'll share it with uh, with Simon to share with the rest of the people on here. No. Right. Thank, thanks, Holly. Tracy's put a question in. She's left now. She had to move on, but um, I'm sure she won't mind us using her question. She says, can we use refusal to take a test as a selection criteria for working in the office or being furloughed? I, I think... Um, in theory, yes. Um, it could be one of the criteria that could be used that um, if they're not prepared to take the test and we do need to, we do need to fur furlough people before within the purpose of the scheme, um, then we could take that decision based on the fact that um, they refuse to take the test. We want to minimise the risk of transmission in the workplace, um, you know, and um, furlough them. But I said there's a bit of a question mark as to whether the vaccine actually stops transmission. So the reasons for furloughing them because they're refusing to take the test might not be very sound and um, that, that's my only concern um that you know if we're saying we're going to furlough you because you've not taken the test what is our real business reason for that and so we get that scientific data to back it up i think um employers are on a bit of a you know it's a bit difficult to to force someone to to take a test or have good grounds to force someone to take a test though i did see in the questions before sam someone else asked a question or, or made a note that they're required by the Premier League to test people uh, attending their training grounds. Um, so I think where you've got an external body that you are regulated by um, or that you have to comply with the rules that they impose upon you, then that becomes an easier reason to test staff and, and to force testing upon them uh, because you then can't physically undertake the activities for that, for that body unless you comply with their rules. So um, so that, that would then give you more grounds to, to maybe take disciplinary action against those refusing to take the test and it's considered dismissal for, for those that aren't. Okay, cheers. If anyone does have a question, just unmute. We're, we're a relatively small group now, so if you want to unmute yourself and just put your question to Ollie, I've, I've got one, which um, I think I know the answer to. If, if, um, if an employee has been recruited after the end of October, uh, and then has to be, f or, and then can't work due to lockdown three and childcare reasons. Is there anything we can do on furlough with them? Um, we can't, we can't furlough them because they won't be eligible. Um, so we're literally limited to um, unpaid leave um, or dependent care leave, asking them to take some holiday leave or a combination of both, um, looking at flexible working to maybe reduce their hours of work and therefore our overheads, um, and giving them a bit more time at home. Um, you sort of, just thinking outside of the box, really, just to think of ways in which we can support that employee with their childcare challenges, um, whilst hopefully keeping them involved in the business. Um, you know, I've got some clients that have completely changed their shift patterns, particularly those that do work in an office. They sort of say, well, rather than doing your nine till five, if you work sort of six till nine, and then sort of in the evening and play catch up in the evening, then we'll be happy with that. Um, but reducing their hours, you know, the number of days they're working that week, so they're not working sort of 70 plus hour week because obviously looking after children during the day is not easy um you know so when you add that onto a day's work as well it's uh, i think employees need to just take that into amount into account and you know get that work-life balance you're on mute Simon. i am i think i'd have worked this out after 12 months wouldn't you mm -hmm. um i've got a question i want to give roxanne a bit more screen time so i know you, you mentioned agriculture uh, roxanne but um a lot of our members in the hospitality sector and i'm guessing they're not recruiting at 26 grand and above um what what are the options for our hospitality members bringing in talent from overseas because i know they do rely on a lot of Euro european workers yeah so there's other types of uh, i mean the skilled worker effectively sort of replaces the old tier two general visa um that we used to have in place prior to um, the 1st of January this year, which always had sort of an eligibility requirement in terms of salary. So um, I, I think it remains to be seen in terms of the different types of routes that 
uh, the government is currently uh, allowing us to do. So they have piloted, obviously, the the, the agriculture, uh, you know, the pilot at the moment. Um, there will be other routes which don't require a, a sponsorship license um, in terms of that actually coming through from, from the government. So I'd say that you just need to have a look at that um, and see, you know, which one it is that we, that we could actually utilise. Um, so, you know, there's depending on what type of sector you're in, there's sort of things for sports, sort of things for different ways where a sponsorship license might not be required. So, um, you know, I can, what I can do after this is maybe summarise the different types of visas that are now available since there's been a, a shake up of them um, and put that into the group as well, um, if that would assist. I think that will be useful. I know certainly I've had conversations with um, a handful of our hospitality companies, a lot of their workers of during covid have, have sort of gone back got gone gone into europe and but of course we'll be wanting to come back when, when their establishments reopen um and i think it's a concern for some of them certainly yeah so if you can we'll, we'll include that in the follow-up email thanks um one last opportunity for questions slightly tongue-in-cheek ollie but a hypothetical situation what what let's say there was a a, a member of staff who was on flexible furlough let's say I don't know, we'll call her Debbie, just, just for the sake of argument. Um, how does one stop this hypothetical employee called Debbie responding to her work emails on a Thursday and a Friday? Um, so if those are the days that she's uh, flexible furloughed, um, if she's not distracted by the alcohol behind her and she you know, wants to get involved in her emails, then um, I'd say really it's down to the employer to manage that and to, to be clear in their instructions not to do it. And if they do do it, to forewarn them that um, you know, sort of potentially they're compromising the ability to uh, to claim the grant. Um, there is under a lot of the furlough leave agreements that we've drafted, there is the ability of the employer to recover any part of the furlough grant that wasn't recovered from the government from the employee. So you pass a bit of responsibility onto the employee to play their part by not doing things they shouldn't be doing. So if you want me to review Debbie's furlough leave agreement, let me have a look. Let me just ping the <laughs> It's a hypothetical Debbie, obviously. It's not, it's not our Debbie. Surely not. No. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Just Ollie. one question I have for Roxanne, actually, just because I, I think it, if an employee is going through a recruitment process and is looking for skilled talent from abroad, but they don't have a sponsorship license, how, how long does it take to get a sponsorship license in place? It turn, I think the standard turnaround time at the moment is around about eight weeks, but that doesn't mean that it can't go any longer than that. But I think the general guidance is saying, uh, don't delay in sort of making your applications now, obviously, because, you know, there are certain dates that have to be in the diary for this year. Um, and we also have to do sort of our planning management, know who is going to be, you know, um, in terms of our HR, who's going to be running those systems and, and dealing with that recruitment. So standard turnaround time for a sponsorship license from submitting it online um, eight weeks before you're actually getting a decision from the Home Office. Yeah, so I think that needs to be factored into the, the recruitment process, particularly if you expect to be recruiting talent from abroad, then doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I think the other thing that we need to be mindful of as well at the moment in terms of recruiting talent from abroad is um, obviously we've got the, the COVID pandemic as well, but it's still ongoing and um, sort of self-isolation things. So, you know, the, the period of self-isolation that they're going to have to go through when they actually get into the UK as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you both. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you, Ollie. Um, on point as ever. Um, I'll, uh, I'll keep my wrap up very brief. Thank you to, uh, to Naphthans. Thank you to Ollie and Roxanne. Uh, please do check out chamberlive.co.uk uh, for all our upcoming events. We have a, a core networking event next week, the return of Rush Hour. Uh, no speakers, just uh, the opportunity to, um, to work the room. We will... We'll, put people in different rooms and they can uh, meet one another and, um, and get to know each other. That's next Wednesday. Full details on the Chamber website, uh, Wednesday the 27th. Date for your diary is our Expo and Supply Chain Conference on the 7th of October next year. And um, if you are impacted by Brexit in any way and you're having to get your head around documentation and importing and exporting, we've got a number of funded events that are taking place uh, in association with Boost at the moment. You'll find all those events on the Chamber website as well. Uh, stay safe, and more importantly, I think stay dry, uh, given what's going on at the moment. And uh, and thanks for uh, thanks for attending today, and we'll see you soon. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye. 
Thanks for watching this Chamber Live video from the East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce. If you've enjoyed this content, then you might enjoy some of the other content that's on the screen now. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel.